I hope you enjoy my stories. Instead of just clicking thumbs down, please comment and share how we can do better. If you do like our video then please like and subscribe. HOA False Accusations It's like something out of a bad sitcom. One day, I come home to find the gate of our community looking like it had been in a collision with a freight train, and the cameras, well, they might as well have been props for decoration. So, naturally, the HOA manager marches over to me, wagging his finger and accusing me of being the culprit. According to him, my car was supposedly caught red-handed on camera, cruising through the gate at the scene of the crime. But when I asked for a glimpse of this so-called evidence, they shut me down faster than you can say, cover up. Yeah, I drove through that gate, but it was already a hot mess by then. And what's the cherry on top of this whole debacle? There are at least five other cars in our community identical to mine, but who do they pick out of the lineup? Yours truly. Why? Oh, because I decided to treat my ride to a fresh coat of paint a few weeks back. It was a primo job, I'm talking showroom quality. Now, I'm just biding my time until my appointment to get that sleek mat wrap. But according to the HOA, I might as well have set up a DIY auto body shop in my garage and spent the night giving my car a makeover, only to parade it down the driveway like some kind of automotive fashion show. Give me a break. Let's delve into the nitty gritty here. That gate wasn't just mildly damaged, it looked like it had been through a war zone. We're talking about the kind of destruction you'd expect from a car crash that leaves the vehicle in a state beyond repair. Either someone swung at it with a heavy duty chain, which would imply they got out of the car to do the deed, and where's the footage of that little escapade? Or, and this is the kicker, the force behind the impact was so immense that any car involved should have been rendered a total write-off. I'm talking about the kind of collision that makes you wonder if a runaway semi-truck took a detour through the neighborhood. And as for those cameras, well, they might as well have been props for a low-budget horror flick. Not a single one of them was in working order. So here we are, forking over our hard-earned cash to the HOA, expecting a modicum of security, and what do we get? broken cameras left, right, and center. It's like paying for a security system only to find out the alarms are made of cardboard and duct tape. Now, to add insult to injury, today they're hitting me with a whopping $15,000 bill for damages I'm absolutely certain I didn't cause. The nerve of it. They send this over in a letter accompanied by three measly pictures of the gate, snapped on someone's phone, no less. I mean, come on. Where's the professionalism? Where's the evidence? Where are the videos that should have been captured by those non-functioning cameras? It's like they expect me to just fork over a hefty sum based on some grainy snapshots and their word alone. And let me tell you, my wife is reaching the end of her tether with this whole charade. She's practically pulling her hair out over the sheer absurdity of it all. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's not just about the money. It's about the principle of the thing. We're being unfairly targeted and expected to foot the bill for something we had nothing to do with. It's enough to make anyone lose their cool. So, should I get a lawyer involved? Sue the HOA for falsely accusing me and failing to keep our community secure? It's clear they were hoping to pull a fast one, trying to squeeze money from my insurance without anyone catching on. Well, they've got another thing coming. I'm not about to let them get away with it. I mean, imagine if I hadn't questioned their accusations. They'd have pocketed my insurance money, swept this whole mess under the rug, and left me high and dry. But not on my watch. I'm not handing over a single dime to them without a fight. It's time to bring in the big guns, lawyers, to sort this mess out. The HOA needs to be held accountable for their false accusations and negligence. They've clearly failed to uphold their end of the bargain in keeping our community safe and secure. It's time they face the consequences of their actions. And you can bet I'll be pushing for more than just compensation for the damages they wrongly pinned on me. This is about justice, plain and simple. Can an HOA fine a homeowner for a rule that was made up? So. I'm checking my email, and boom, there it is, 
a message from the property management team laying down the law about snow removal. They're saying if your car is parked in your driveway or in the guest parking during snow removal and the contractor can't get to it, you gotta dig it out yourself or risk getting fined. This is what it said. 3. If you are parked in your driveway or in the guest parking during snow removal and the contractor is unable to clean your driveway or guest parking, you are responsible to clear the snow from these areas. Homeowners that do not clear these areas when they are responsible are subject to a fine. Now, I'm scratching my head because there's no such rule before. And why should I be responsible for clearing snow in my driveway? What gives them the authority to fine me for that? The HOA or my neighbors ain't affected, so what's the deal? I mean, seriously, I've been living here for years, and suddenly they're dropping this bombshell on me? It's got me wondering where they're pulling this authority from. And come on, why should I be the one breaking my back to clear out snow that the contractor couldn't handle? It's not like the HOA or my neighbors are going to be the ones struggling to get their car out of the snow. It feels like they're just passing the buck onto us for something that's not even our responsibility. I mean, Minnesota winters are no joke. We're talking about three to five feet of snow, with snowbanks taller than me. Even our community has snowbanks over 10 feet high at the end of every street from all the plowing. It's like living in a frozen tundra half the year. The snow piles up so high that you could practically lose a small car in it. And let's not even mention the bone-chilling temperatures that accompany all that snow. It's a real struggle just to get out of the house sometimes, let alone deal with clearing snow from the driveway. And what about the snowbirds? People who head south for the winter, what are they supposed to do with their cars when they're chilling in Florida? And how the hell am I supposed to know when the plows are coming through? They showed up at midnight one night, like, seriously? It's not just about the inconvenience. It's about the practicality too. I mean, a lot of folks in our neighborhood head south for the winter to escape the brutal cold. But now, they're expected to somehow manage their cars remotely while they're soaking up the sun in Florida? It's a bit unrealistic, to say the least. And let's talk about the plows. How are we supposed to plan around them when they show up randomly? One night they're clearing the streets at midnight waking up the whole neighborhood with their noisy engines and flashing lights. It's like playing a game of chance trying to predict when they'll come through next. And what's the deal with the fine anyway? They didn't even mention that. So if I park in someone else's guest parking or even in another person's driveway with permission, am I okay? Because they specifically said, your driveway or guest parking. It's like they're trying to make this rule as confusing as possible. Are they saying if I park in someone else's spot, I'm off the hook? Or is it just a blanket rule for everyone in the community? And what about those who share driveways or have multiple cars? It feels like they're leaving a lot of gray areas. And then they throw in this word, when, in the last sentence. What's that supposed to mean? Either I'm responsible or I'm not. If they meant, when, then tell us when it's our responsibility. This whole thing is just stupid. And no, this ain't some joke, it's real. It's like they're playing word games with us, leaving us scratching our heads trying to figure out what they really mean. It's frustrating and just adds unnecessary stress to an already challenging Minnesota winter. HOA doubling maintenance fees. I live in an HOA in New Jersey where the upcoming agenda includes a vote to amend the master deed. The proposed amendment aims to alter the method by which maintenance fees are assessed. Currently, these fees are determined by each owner's percentage of interest in the community. This percentage is calculated based on the total square footage of all units, which is then divided equally among homeowners. This means that those with larger properties contribute more to the maintenance fees, reflecting their higher stake in the community's common areas and amenities. Since our community comprises townhouses, duplexes, and condos of varying sizes, the percentage of interest in the community also varies among the dwellings. Some properties hold a higher percentage of interest, reflecting their larger size or prime location within the community, while others have a lower percentage. 
This differentiation ensures that each homeowner contributes proportionately to the maintenance and upkeep of shared spaces. When purchasing a unit in the community, the percentage of interest is recorded in the sale agreement and your deed. This percentage serves as a crucial aspect of homeownership, influencing not only your financial obligations but also your voting rights within the HOA. It's a fundamental part of the property's value and its role within the community's governance structure. Based on the tax assessor's records, the board has discovered discrepancies in the square footage of 80 out of the 500 units in the community compared to the developer's original plans. This discrepancy has led to the 80 units not paying their fair share in maintenance fees, as their assessed square footage inaccurately reflects their actual size. As a result, these units may be contributing less than they should towards the upkeep of common areas and amenities, putting additional financial strain on other homeowners. Addressing this issue is crucial to ensure equitable distribution of maintenance costs across the community. The board has stated that they won't alter the deeds of those units with inaccurate square footage, citing the exhaustive process involved. Instead, they're proposing a new method to assess maintenance fees by simply taking inventory of the square footage from the tax records and dividing it equally among all units. This approach aims to streamline the process and avoid the complexities of adjusting individual deeds. Under this proposed new system, the 80 units with discrepancies in their square footage would see a significant increase in their maintenance fees, potentially up to 80% more than their current fees. This adjustment aims to ensure that these units contribute their fair share towards the upkeep of the community's shared spaces and amenities. Conversely, other units in the community would likely experience a slight decrease in their maintenance fees, reflecting a more equitable distribution of costs overall. While this new method may address the immediate issue of inaccurate square footage, it has raised concerns among some residents about the fairness of such a substantial increase for certain homeowners. Others are supportive of the proposal, seeing it as a necessary step toward rectifying the inequities in maintenance fee contributions within the community. However, under this proposal, the association will not increase the percentage of interest for those 80 units, as it is recorded on their deeds and deemed too difficult to change. Despite the discrepancy in square footage, the recorded percentage of interest remains unchanged due to the complexities involved in altering property deeds. This decision has sparked debate among residents, with some questioning the fairness of allowing these units to continue paying lower fees despite their larger size. Others argue that changing the percentage of interest would introduce further complications and legal hurdles. But the percentage of interest holds significant importance within the community. It not only determines your voting power in community matters but also plays a crucial role in determining the value of surplus if distributed by the association. Additionally, it serves as a fundamental aspect of the value of the property you own in the community. This percentage reflects your stake in the shared amenities, common areas, and overall governance of the community. Therefore, any adjustments to this percentage can have far-reaching implications for homeowners, affecting their financial interests and their voice in decision-making processes within the HOA. So now, 80 units will pay nearly double their current rate, but will not share the benefit of the percentage of interest that is commensurate with those higher fees. Some of the fees are even higher than units that will retain a higher percentage of interest in the community after this amendment. This disparity seems incredibly unfair. Those units paying significantly higher fees should logically be entitled to a proportional increase in their percentage of interest within the community. It's a matter of equity and transparency. This raises questions about the legality of the situation. It seems unjust to impose such significant fee increases without corresponding adjustments to the percentage of interest. Homeowners in these units may rightfully wonder if this practice is permitted under HOA regulations or even state law. It's crucial to ensure that any actions taken by the HOA are in compliance with relevant statutes and do not violate homeowners' rights. I believe it's incumbent upon the HOA to take proactive steps to address this issue. Inspecting the units to confirm their square footage and working to amend the deeds accordingly would be a more equitable solution. This would ensure that owners of these units receive the benefits associated with their increased maintenance fees, including a proportionate share of voting power and surplus distribution. Am I wrong to think this way? Any advice or insights would be greatly appreciated.
I would like to thank you for watching the video to the end. To encourage us to make more videos. Please. Like. Subscribe. Comment. As well as share. Check out this other video if you haven't already.